thank you, David. When Julia uh, contacted me uh, about participating tonight, she suggested that, that a role I might want to take on is um, to sum up, to be, the, in a sense, the tail gunner for tonight and to uh, lead us into the discussion because I think the real value from, from such events comes not so much in the formal presentation but in the discussion that follows. So taking up that theme, what I, what I want to do in, in my few short minutes is, is really three things. The first thing, give you my impression of uh, and summation of, of the presentations that we've heard earlier. Try to put a wrapper round the various different contributions so that it, it makes sense and can be used as an input to, to thinking. Secondly, um, to try and identify one or two gaps that I see that still exist in this area where there's a need for more thinking and more reflection and more research and to illustrate some of those gaps with, with one or two of the things where we've been done, uh, we've been doing recently. And finally, uh, to suggest two or three topics that might actually be useful focal points for our forthcoming discussion. So that, that, that's my uh, trinary uh, of set of objectives. So in terms of what we've heard so far, I think uh, as previous speakers have, have said, without any collusion uh, at all, we've, we've pre presented, I think, rather a coherent set of perceptions of what, what the key issues are. And I've tried to summarise what I've seen and heard from the presentation. Um, uh, starting off with Jennifer and echoed through a number of the other speakers that we've heard, this idea of growing complexity and that complexity arising not only from projects themselves becoming more complex and technologically sophisticated, but also increasing interdepend interdepend awareness of the interdependency as well as actual interdependency. So systems were always interdependent, but we perhaps understand the existence of those interdependencies a little strong, more strongly than we did in the past. Second thing that's come out in various forms is the, the role of digital in enabling various sorts of new forms of, of uh, treatment of those interdependencies and that complexity. Again, Jennifer specifically mentioned uh, digital innovation in, in various aspects of process management, but I think the same thing flows through the other presentations as well. And particularly, I, I think Eric's presentation about the, the sensing layer, if you want. And the, the thing that struck me about that was the commodification of sensing. That once that initial investment is made, they then become essentially a trivial cost commodity. And the issue is no longer, I think, so much one of designing the optimal sensor for my particular application, but rather we have this complex ecosystem of many different forms of sensing layer, highly volatile, highly unstable, of very, very variable quality and form. How do we make the best use of that environment? And that's a question in part about understanding that, that ecosystem of sensing both where it is and where it's going in the future, and, and we'll come back to that point in a moment. Then Kuhn and, and also, I think, the other speakers, and from a slightly different perspective, have, have emphasised the importance of, of the user, the user experience, and of user behaviour. Eric mentioned demand response and uh, dynamic pricing and so on, and uh, addressing some of the challenges that historically have existed in that area. And I think that's going to become more and more important because the sorts of issues that we've seen in the energy infrastructure uh, around demand response and mitigating peaks, these are not, that's not an issue that's isolated to the energy infrastructure. It's pervasive across all infrastructures, and it exists also on the boundary between different infrastructures. So the retail sector induces all sorts of peakiness in the logistics sector, which then projects that peakiness into the transport sector, which then echoes that into the energy sector, and so on. So the peakiness is interrelated as well. And finally, 
Uh, Mark's presentation highlighted in a variety, from a variety of different perspectives all the clever new things that we can do with that sensing data. New data enables new sorts of analytics, both the diagnostic analytics, you know, why, why is this broken and what can we do to fix it, but also the predictive analytics around both design and operation and management of systems. So I think we've, we've covered a number of those areas now very comprehensively in the different presentations. But I think there are a few things that we haven't really talked a great deal about, or at least only briefly touched on. And this gives me an opportunity to both highlight these and also to say a little bit about what, what we've done recently. So, uh, understandably, given the composition of the audience and indeed speakers, we've been mainly focusing on construction, and the construction process and the various stages leading up to the construction process and, and following from the, design, from the decision to proceed with the construction activity. But there's also a massive issue as associated with asset management, what used to be called maintenance. And that, I think, has received much less attention from the civil engineering community. It's not as glamorous an area as construction, yet it's incredibly important. And linking this to the availability of commodified sensing seems to me to be a very fruitful direction. So a few years ago, one of the things we started off doing was asking ourselves, can, can we do better than uh, to have um, uh, timetable-driven maintenance protocols associated with the uh, interurban motorway network? Can we bring ideas of condition-based monitoring and maintenance from other industries where they are common into this sector and do it without having to invest large sums of money in dedicated sensing infrastructure. Because if one had to do that, then it's not going to work. So this led to, there's quite a lot of words on this, but the essential idea is if you are clever in the way in which you combine existing commodified sensing, be it tracking technologies, be it the sort of accelerometer technologies, or be it axle monitoring technologies, which are also now commodified, you can have indirect models that give you a good indication of the condition of the infrastructure and use that to drive a sophisticated condition-based asset management system. And that's, and I think, an example of taking this idea of, it's not just construction, but it's also maintenance and operation, and linking that with the idea of commodified sensing and producing something that we hope is really useful. Um, we talked a bit about uh, indeed a lot, about interdependencies. And naturally and entirely predictably, we think about interdependencies principally in terms of the physical layer, that this pipe from this system connects to that pipe from that system, and if it doesn't, then there's a problem and that's a critical interdependency. Of course that's right. But there's another layer that's arguably just as important, uh, both for planning, design, and also for operation. And that's the interdependencies between the different uncertainties that arise out of the various processes, infrastructures, and behaviors that characterize large, complex systems. And we, as a profession, are incredibly bad, by and large, at treating uncertainty. And I think government has a large measure of responsibility to play because, uh, to take for that because it shoves things like the, the, the green book methodologies down our throats, simple discounting factors. It makes those mandatory in a, in a number of investment contexts when clearly that sort of approach to treating uncertainty is, is frankly laughable. So uh, one of the things we, we started to do a few years ago was to, to think about what other industries and sectors have complex problems of um, multiple types of interdependent and highly dynamic uncertainties, and what can we learn from those sectors 
and translate into the infrastructure sector. So this resulted in a, in a project that's just coming to an end now, um, in which we've taken ideas from the field of financial, econ financial engineering, if you like, real options theory, and created a way in which we can represent structural interdependencies between different sources of uncertainty in such situations and actually use that knowledge to help produce better initial investment decisions and better scheduling and phasing of all that follows after an initial investment decision, such as expansion or maintenance or decommissioning. And again, there's lots of stuff out there that, that you'll see in due course on that. The, the third point that I think is very important and that um, uh, could be seen as negative, I mean, this is a bit of the, uh, the conflictual approach that, that Eric was referring to, is that I've been around modelling long enough to know that, that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah? Um, show me a modeller that doesn't want to create a more complicated model because the world is always that little bit more complicated than your current model. And all the incentive structures that operate on academics are pushing you in the direction of making an even more complicated model. And I think we've got to be aware that um, there's a diminishing return to scale here, and there are serious risks associated with um, essentially creating layers of analytics that we don't fully understand or can, can control. And uh, I think this is growing as a risk, as the availability of data and as the sophistication of the modelling tools that we have likewise grows. And I think we need to be aware of the risk of effectively, for the best possible reasons, engineering in vulnerabilities. We, we ought to be thinking, and I think Mark is, in his work, thinking about engineering those out. But not everybody is. A lot of people are just thinking about, let's make it a more complicated model, because more complicated is better. I think we, we ought to be very cautious about that. Um, the final point I want to make, uh, that seems to me to be a gap, is around the question of the, uh, who, whose data are all these? You know, we've all been talking in various ways about data, but those data don't exist. You know, they, they've got a mummy and a daddy, and they've got an owner. And at the moment, the market structure surrounding the various types of data that we've been talking about here is a complete and utter mess. There is no design thinking that has gone into the structuration of those markets. And you know, we've, we've looked at this in one particular context because I'm a, a transport person. Well, I used to be a mathematician, then I was an economist, now I'm a transport person. I'm going down the tubes. Um, uh, and I've looked at this context, looked at this issue in the context of, of transportation systems, where what we see at the moment at the level of operations of transport system is very complex data relationships between public and private bodies. Uh, mobile network operators, for example, trying to sell their, their data to public authorities. On the other hand, other tech companies such as Google trying to acquire data from local authorities that will feed into their services. And all of these relationships are done in a market structure that, that doesn't effectively exist. It's a series of ad hoc, binary, bipartite relationships between particular entities. And no one is really analyzing, until we started doing this, what sort of market structure should apply and what the risks of different market structures are. And I think this sort of work, which this particular example is in the, in the transport area, but this sort of work around the market structure and the market design associated with the information layer is extremely important and needs to be done and needs to be done in a hurry, particularly in, in a BIM emerging world. 
So let me go on to the final bit, the third bit, which is uh, three ideas or three themes that I think might be useful uh, as a starting point for a discussion. Um, by and large, you all come from the big end of the construction industry. But you'll all know that the construction sector has a very long tail. There's lots and lots of stuff that's built out there by small companies. And this, these are quite distinct from the, the big projects that Jennifer was talking about or from HS2, but it doesn't make them any less important. It doesn't make them any less significant. What happens about all of that? Do, do, do we simply fissure into two worlds where we have a, a high-tech, big, big construction sector over here and then we have this, this very long tail which gradually, gradually loses traction completely? And of course, those two sectors come together because you will use subcontractors and you will seek to impose your protocols on your subcontractors and on your sub-subcontractors and so on. And eventually a point will be reached where the thing potentially breaks down. And that relates also to the second point. We have, obviously, a very large installed base of infrastructure to which very few of the dedicated big project type methods or processes will immediately apply. What do we do about that? Do we just ignore that and say that's nothing to do with us? That's somebody else's problem? We're only interested in the new stuff? Or do we try and engage with that? For example, there is a completely massive issue around facilities management for existing infrastructures. The maintenance issue is one part of that. Very little attention being given to that, I think. And finally, underpinning all of this, is the question of skills and talent. Uh, the sorts of changes that, that everybody else was, was talking about here uh, aren't, aren't incremental. It's not like deciding I'm going to use pink note paper rather than blue note paper. You can't just do it by management fiat. You, you need different and better people. Where do you get them? How do you train them? How do you create that asset that's just as important as the bricks and mortar and the digital and so on? So that's all I wanted to say by way of stimulation and, and provocation. I hope I've been successful in that. Thank you.